Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Mark Lavoie. Mark is a professor of economics at the University of Ottawa and an author of a recent article on the Bank of Canada's operating system. Mark is also the co-author of a popular textbook titled Monetary Economics, an Integrated Approach to Credit, Money, Income, Production, and Wealth. Mark joins us today to discuss these works. Mark, welcome to the show. Yes, thank you. I was excited to come across your article on the Bank of Canada's operating system. As you know, Mark, we've been discussing operating systems on the show already. It's been a hot topic down here in the U.S. with the Fed's operating system, some of the challenges they have. And so it was great to find someone who's written a detailed article on what Canada is doing, because Canada seems to be doing it right, whatever they're doing, or at least doing it better than we are in the United States. And also your your textbook. I've had many listeners uh, actually write in or call in and say they want to have you on the show because you've got a pretty well-known textbook. And so I'd like to get to both of those on the show. Now, I also understand, Mark, that you are a former Olympic fencing athlete. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Uh, I was at the Olympics in 1976 in Montreal and in 1984 in Los Angeles. Wow. I think this is the first time we've had an Olympic athlete on the show. So it's pretty always awesome. always first. Yeah, well, you're an Olympic athlete and you're you know, a fairly well-known macroeconomist. You don't get that combination very often, if ever. So thanks for coming on the show. And before we get into your material and, and the work that you've done, tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you get into macroeconomics? Well, my father was an economist. He was a representative for Canada at the trade negotiations. Okay. Uh, in the late 50s uh, and uh, in the 60s. That m- might be the reason I got interested into economics. And uh, yeah, I thought macro was more interesting than uh, micro because macro dealt with these big questions such as uh, money, uh, un- unemployment, inflation, and so on. Yeah, and you come from a country that has... I, in my view, done relatively well compared to the United States on, on many of the questions we look at in macroeconomics. So, for example, during the Great Depression, I understand Canada had a Great Depression, but they didn't lose banks like the U.S. did. And they've had a relatively resilient financial system compared to the U.S. And uh, their monetary policy seems to be doing better. And it just it seems on many fronts, Canada has done an, a better job. At least it looks better and it seems easier than what we've dealt with in the U.S. So, I'm thrilled to get a macroeconomist from Canada on the show to talk about it. Now, I want to begin with your paper on the operating system in Canada, and the title of it is A System of Zero Reserves with Clearing Outside of the Central Bank, the Canadian Case. And we'll provide a link to it on the webpage for the show. And again, the reason I I want to talk about this is that the Bank of Canada makes it look so easy when it comes to operating systems. And you compare that to what we've had in the U.S., it's just remarkable. And we're going to go into great detail here in a bit, but so many things about the operating system there are just so fascinating. You you mentioned in the introduction, very few reserves or settlement balances, as you, as you call them, are, are actually used in the system. The system is cleared outside the bank, central bank through a private clearing system. Um, the central bank doesn't have to intervene that much actually to, to hit its target. It, in fact, it hits its target rate. The overnight rates track the target rate very closely. They do a relatively good job. And again, compared to the U.S. and the floor system, which was supposed to increase interest rate control of the Fed, the corridor system in Canada has done a much better job. Um, in fact, you know, I always use Canada as kind of a benchmark case for what a corridor system could be. And Canada has a symmetric corridor system. The U.S. had a kind of an asymmetric one before 2008. So you know, just to be clear, those of us here in the U.S. who would like to see the Fed go to a corridor system, we mean something like Canada as a symmetric corridor system. And interestingly, Canada, they had a corridor system before the financial crisis. They temporarily went to a floor system. And then they came back to a corridor system. So it's possible. And there's lots of questions I have. So we'll get into them as we get into your to your article. 
But uh, I, I'm just wondering, from your perspective up north there in Canada, looking down here at the U.S., or do you ever wonder why we struggle so hard with our monetary policy and our operating systems down here? Well, I think that perhaps the main reason is, is a simple one, is that in Canada we only have uh, about 15, well, direct clearers or banks that are uh, involved with the clearing and settlement system. So th things are much simpler than they can be in the United States. Uh, we, we don't have uh, foreign central banks who wish to hold uh, deposits at the, at the Fed or at the central bank. So it's true. I, I mean, as you explained, uh, it is true that uh, we have a good clearing and settlement system in place. Uh, but I, I, I'm not sure that it would be possible to implement exactly the same thing with as much success in the United States simply because uh, you have a much, um, many more banks and a much more complicated system as far as I can understand. Yeah, that's kind of been the answer I've gotten too is banks down here are very different like that's kind of a defining characteristic of the banking system. It's it's very diverse. There's many many banks, very different sizes, and in the case of reserves or settlement balances in the U.S., only a few big ones hold most of what's left. And you know, one of the issues during the repo market crisis, well, where are they sitting? Who's holding them? Are they distributed evenly or not? And so it's 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 true. And I've I've heard this as a critique against Canada that Canada has a more concentrated banking system, but. The trade-off is you seem to have had a, a better experience with financial stability. So do, do you view that as a good trade-off? You know, it's more concentrated, the banking system, but on one hand, but on the other hand, you seem to do better financially? I think so. Uh, I mean, if you take the European case, you, you can see there's a lot of competition out there. And uh, their system is also pretty fragile. And, and I think, uh, I mean, later you, you, you will talk, be talking about post-Kinsian theory. Yeah, <laughs> But I, I think what, one of the beliefs among us is that, uh, you know, full-out competition does not necessarily bring uh, more stability. So I, I think the banking system is, is a, a good example of that. So it's, it's a good trade-off. And uh, again, just to, to reiterate some of the facts from Canada, during the Great Depression, which Canada also experienced, zero banks were closed down. That's what I've read in several places. Yes. Now, there was some consolidation, some merging that had to occur, but zero banks shut down in Canada, where we had around 9,000 in the U.S. And, and you know, part of the problem in the U.S. is, is I, I wouldn't, I mean, you attribute it to competition. I attribute it to unit banking laws. You know, these many of these banks were only allowed to have one branch. They couldn't diversify. Now, I know in Canada, for example, because you have so few you know, banks, they have branches throughout the country, so they're more diversified. Portfolio of assets are better. So there, there's just many things they did right that we haven't done right in the U.S., and maybe we can't replicate it. You know, Maybe it's impossible to turn back the clock and, and get something like Canada, but I do think we can do better. And there, there's yeah, a... Drink Go ahead. During the Great, during the Great Depression, you, you had in the U.S. you had these laws where banks could only be state banks; they could only be in in one bank. So, of course, you know you couldn't have this spread in deposits and, and yep. loans. Uh, but you, during the Great Depression in Canada, uh, I mean, the belief is that um, many, perhaps all of our banks were insolvent, but because nobody ever said anything. Then they just could keep keep on going until uh, things got better and they became uh, solvent again. Yeah, well, there's lots lots to learn from from Canada's experience. And what's interesting, also, you mentioned your post Keynesian, and we'll talk about that second half of the show. So there's been a number of us here in the U.S. who've been advocating or, or would like to see the U.S. move to something more like a corridor system, a symmetric corridor system, and the people I see promoting it the most are people like myself, George Selgin, Bill Nelson, people who kind of, you know, mainstream macro folks. But I've also seen a lot of post-Keynesians that they, they point to Canada as a better example of how a, a operating system should work. So it's an interesting convergence of some different views. And maybe we'll come back to that later as well. Um, well, 
Go ahead. On, on, on this issue, uh, <laughs> I personally believe that the the floor system can be just as efficient. Oh, you do. As a corridor system. Yes, I, I don't think one is necessarily or has to be better than the other. I mean, if you up until very recently, uh, the floor system in the U.S. worked quite well. I mean, the the actual federal funds rate or the repo rate was very close, was inside the target. So I must say I discussed this with a Ph.D. student of mine <laughs> and uh, we were trying hard to, to figure out why it is that uh, the repo rate went out. Uh, of where it should have been. But anyway, you, you, you could see also everybody was very worried around Christmas time what would happen to the repo rate and, uh, and, and or the Fed funds rate and uh, everything was under control uh, at the end of the year. Yeah. Well, let me res- respond to your, your point that a floor system could work well. And I know in textbooks, it, it's true that a floor system in theory should work very, very well. In the U.S., what I saw was, you know, that they implemented the floor system, but it became a leaky floor system. They had to put the overnight repurchase agreement in because rates were falling below the, the target rate. So they it, they had to kind of make it up as they went along to keep it working. It was kind of a patched up floor system. And again, maybe this goes back to the issue you raised earlier that our banking system is so unique, so you know heterogeneous that maybe that's was inevitable. But I like to believe there's a way to make things simpler moving forward. But let's let's move on to your article because it's a really great one. It's a great look at Canada. And I, I want to mention also real quickly, um, Mark, that I was at the American Economic Association meetings here in January. And I went to a session where the deputy governor, Caroline Wilkins, was there from the Bank of Canada. And, you know, there's a time where you can ask questions from the audience. And I was able to ask her, so wh- what is it you guys do that make it – makes it seem so easy compared to what we do here. And um, she gave answers that line up nicely with what you gave in your article. So it's a nice kind of nice segue motivation into your article. So let's just jump into your article. And again, the, the title of the article is A System of Zero Reserves with Clearing Outside the Central Bank, the Canadian Case. So, so tell us about what this is and how did Canada get it? What's the history behind Canada moving towards this system? Uh, I think we can say it all started at the end of the 1980s. The, there were two civil servants or two uh, central bankers who came up with a zero reserve uh, system. So uh, their names were Donna Howard and Kevin Clinton. I, 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 as I said in the paper, I remember very well because I was present at the very first uh, presentation on the possibility of a zero reserve uh, system. And then gradually it got uh, implemented. So by 1994, the, the Bank of Canada had got rid of compulsory reserve requirements. And then uh, gradually they introduced the, the corridor system. And at the same time, they also uh, introduce uh, a more sophisticated clearing and settlement system with Canadian Payment uh, Association. So that regroups uh, the main banks. And uh, yeah, by 1999, so 20 years ago, the system was fully in place. And so what we have now in Canada 20 years later is the same as what was in what was put in place by 1999. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting story on one level because it tells how, two economists can be very influential, right, in, in changing opinion and and uh, leading people down this path. So are, are these individuals still there? Are they still working at the Bank of Canada? No, no. They, oh, okay. Well, Donna Howard retired just a few years ago and Kevin Clinton much earlier. But the, the funny thing is that at, at some point I asked Kevin Clinton where did he get the idea of this corridor system and so on. And he said he got it from the Bank of Sweden. But when I checked what or when the Bank of Sweden implemented such a system, it was after the Bank of Canada. Huh. So Who went so first? We, huh? don't, yeah. we don't really know where the idea came from. Yeah. Except perhaps it came from their minds. Yeah. 
No, it's it's a fascinating history, and and again, the influence of ideas. You know, economists can change policy, and two individuals worked hard, and they 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 changed the direction of of the Bank of Canada, and and the Bank of Canada has had an amazing success with the system. Now let's let's go over kind of the highlights of it, and then we'll dig down deeper into each of them. Um, but you list like I think it was ten characteristics that make it unique. Um, so why don't you just go over those those ten characteristics? How it's it's unique and kind of different than other central banks. Okay. Well, the first one we already discussed. Uh, there's no compulsory reserve requirements for Canadian banks. Usually, reserve requirements are there to smooth uh, the overnight interest rate, uh, but if you have a proper corridor system, then you can uh, even and, and enough enough certainty. Uh, then, uh, as we have found out over the last twenty years, the behavior of these overnight interest rates can be quite smooth, despite having uh, zero reserve requirements. Uh, the second thing is that can it, I mean, in contrast to what is the case at, in England or in Britain, the Canadian banks don't hold precautionary reserves at the central bank. So this helps a lot because the the Bank of Canada knows, so to speak, that the demand for reserves is indeed zero and not some positive number. I've been told that in, in, in Great Britain, it's not like that. Third, yeah, the third point is that all payments go through uh, a clearinghouse, which is privately run. As I said, it's run by the Canadian Payment uh, Association, um, it's, and it's not run on the books of the central bank. So I believe that this is also uh, something quite different. However, settlement occurs on the books of the Bank of Canada just like in, in all the countries. Uh, the Bank of Canada is a participant to the clearing house. And then we get into the issue. Uh, and, and when I was working on this uh, about 10 years ago, I was always wondering, is the Canadian system a gross settlement system or is it a net settlement system? And, uh, well, it, it, it is both. <laughs> That's yeah, that the, was interesting when I was, read that. I was surprised. Yeah, it's both uh, in in the sense that it's it is certainly a net settlement system uh, because all the netting is being done at the clearing house. Uh, but at the same time, when a, a payment goes through, so when there's a some payment that clears, uh, it's definitive. So it's a at the same time, it's a real time settlement system. The, the the banker knows that when he or she receives a payment, it's it's good. Another difference, and that's a un, it's unique. It's unique to Canada. That's really unique. Then in Canada, our overnight target rate is a collateralized rate, and not an uncollateralized one like uh, in the U.S. and. Uh, well, the the overnight interest rate is always very close to the target. I was checking uh, the day before yesterday, and uh, in Canada right now, the target is 1.75, and uh, the number was always, the, the last few days has always been 1.74 or 1.745, uh, so it, it's really very, it's, it's less than one basis point from the target. And as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, this is achieved despite the fact that there's hardly any intervention by the central bank uh, in the repo market um, and or with other kind of open market operation. And so the main tool uh, for the Bank of Canada, and it's been like this for a long time now, is uh, by s moving around um, the bank deposits of the government from either the central bank to the commercial banks or from the commercial banks to the central bank. That's their main tool. That's how, uh, and the numbers change substantially. Uh, that's also something I checked the day before yesterday. 
um, the, the numbers can be huge um, to compensate for either taxes coming into the account of the government and the central bank or the government making payments for its expenditures. And finally, one, one, another key uh, difference is that in Canada, in contrast to almost all of the other countries in the world, the Bank of Canada buys on the primary market 10 to 20 percent of the uh, issues of treasury bills or uh, government bonds that are made. So whereas in the States, as I understand it, uh, the Fed uh, buys them on the secondary market only. Yeah, that last feature was really remarkable. I had George Selgin on maybe a month ago or so on the show, and one of the proposals out there is to get a standing repo facility, and, and George has proposed opening it up to the you know the Treasury or having the Treasury, at least in times of crisis, being able to directly interact with the, the Fed, the central bank. And in many places, like you said, that's not the case. Where in Canada, it's, it's been standard operating procedure for some time. So that was really surprising to learn as well. And again, maybe there's some, some lesson there for other central banks. Now, I want to come back to the one of the, um, I think, key elements of the Bank of Canada's operating system. And this is the large value transfer system or the, the clearinghouse that does all the clearing of payments. Now, you mentioned there is another payment system, but but the large value transfer system and the, the acronym is LTVS. LVTS, yes. Yes. The LTVS is the main payment system. It's like 90% of all transactions. And you mentioned the other one, it's smaller retail payments, and they eventually get, get processed, too, under the same system. So this seems to be – is it fair to say this is kind of the, the, the backbone, the key part of what makes the Canadian system work so well? Maybe, uh, because, as I said, I'm not too sure about the American system, but I remember uh, when I was reading about it, uh, people from the Fed or uh, scholars complaining that in the U.S. there is always the, the issue of the float, the so-called float. So I don't know if it's an issue still, but in the papers that I read uh, at the time, it was. And that meant that uh, it was always possible for a bank uh, to get debited on uh, a payment whereas the other bank would not yet get credited for it. And yep. uh, so this may happen in the ACSS, in the, in the secondary uh, payment system, but it, doesn't, it never happens in the LVTS. Um, so in Canada, the float is not an issue whatsoever. Yeah, I, I think that is a, a key issue here in the U.S. And we, in fact, we've had a show talking about this because the Fed has um, indicated it's going to pursue a real-time payment system. But it, and th but this real-time payment system is going to take maybe five years, it says, or longer. We don't know for sure. But the existing payment network, the legacy payment network that the Fed has, it's it's not a twenty four seven you know three hundred sixty five day a year operation. So they have like the Fed Wire, they also have the National Settlement Service. These are multilateral settlement services owned and operated by the Fed, but they're not available all the time. They're they shut down on holidays. They're they're slow, and so it is a big deal here. We've had Aaron Klein on this show, George Selgin too, and they 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 all talked about how you know you. You payment and when when it actually clears can be several days, and in Canada it's it's same day clearing. Now you mentioned it's a hybrid system. Um, it, yeah, in the LVTS it's the same day. Yeah. In the other in the other system uh, there's a one day lag, but it doesn't matter because as you said, eventually all the balances, ha positive or negative, have to go through the LVTS. Yeah. So th so there's no float. As far as I understand, there's zero float in Canada. Yeah, so this is a way to um, minimize the need for settlement balances, number one. I think from the macro perspective, that's what's interesting to us is, you know, how, what would be the demand for settlement balances if you had a more real-time payment system? But number two, from a kind of a consumer's perspective, it, it's, it's nice to get payment immediately. If you're a lower-income person and you can't use your funds immediately, that becomes a big deal here in the U.S., 
So something that the Canadians don't deal with. But again, it's interesting, this, this other point about the LTVS is that it's this hybrid system. It's both a net and a real-time gross settlement. It's, it's a bit of both. And, uh, it, and my understanding is the reason it has elements of both is that it gives you the, the speed, kind of a, a real-time payment, but it doesn't require all the collateral because you're still netting it. It's, it's still kind of, it's less collateral heavy compared to a pure system. There's a lot less collateral being involved. Um, and because it's in real time and because there's no float, there is no uncertainty about what is your position uh, in the clearing house, whether you have positive or negative balances. And it's the same for the Bank of Canada. I think it, this is something I emphasize a lot in the paper. It's this issue of certainty is that by the time the, the clearing and settlement system closes down, each bank knows exactly what its position is in the clearing house. And the central bank knows exactly what is its own position overall in the clearing house. And so it can decide how much to move towards the how, how much of its government deposits it has to move to the commercial banks or vice versa going the other way how much it has to move in order to achieve overall uh, a total amount of settlement balances that will be exactly equal to zero well in, in in reality it's not exactly equal to zero it's always 250 million dollars but it's like nothing uh, overall. Yeah. Now, I've heard that the Bank of Canada or the, the Canadian payment system is is going to eventually move to a full or pure real-time um, gross settlement system. Is that right? Are they going to transition out of this LVTS? I didn't hear about this. Um, okay. Well, maybe I'm perhaps, mistaken. But uh, uh, be, Because, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about blockchain and all that. Yeah. From what I read, uh, the, the belief was that uh, the LVTS is working so well, <laughs> there's no point in trying to implement such a thing. Yeah, I'd hate to uh, ruin something that's working really well. Now, I, yes. I, I want to go back to, um, again, thinking about this in terms of how what would it mean for the U.S. Now, I, as I mentioned earlier, I was able to ask Deputy Governor Caroline Wilkins at the meetings this year, you know, I asked, how do you guys do it? How do you make it look so easy? And and I asked, you know, one question I, I kind of followed up was with, you know, especially in light of, of Basel III, which has all these requirements for leverage ratios and, you know, capital adequacy and, and all these new regulations have come online. And, and she made a couple points. One of them I understood. The other one I'm, I'm still wrapping my mind around. But, but one of them is she, she just made this point that Banks in Canada simply have never been used to operating with lots of settlement balances. They're they're used to you know operating with very very few, and you you create that habit, you create that culture. It's it's easy to go from you know in, in two thousand nine and it went from a, a corridor to a floor. It was easy to go back to a corridor because that's what banks that's what they knew, and they'd been used to it for some time. Um, she also mentioned that one reason it was easy to go back to a corridor system is because the Bank of Canada didn't really ever do QE like the U.S. It, its balance sheet expanded, but only for liquidity or credit easing conditions. It wasn't doing outright QE like the U.S., especially on the scale of the U.S. So that also made the transition easier. But I, I do think her point about not being used to lots of reserves is, is an important one. And Bill Nelson, who's a previous guest on the show, and he's thought a lot about this issue, he made a comment at a conference down here at Brookings on the repo market crisis that really resonated with me. And he made this point that he had talked to some of these big banks in New York City that are sitting on these reserves. And he asked them, you know, why didn't you, you know, lend these reserves out when you could have earned money in the overnight markets? So, you know, banks were earning close to 2%. Overnight markets, Yields got as high as 10%. And they said, this is what they told him. They said, yeah, we could have you know, made some quick money had we done that. But if we had done that, it's it's so different than what we've done the past 10 years. The past 10 years, 
at least since 2008, they've had lots of reserves. Bank supervisors expect them to have reserves. And if you do something very different than what you've done, that there's this kind of new culture that's set in since the crisis that anything radical or different, it would have you know, brought the the closer look of a bank supervisor. And it just was too risky to rock the boat. And so Bill Nelson's point, I think, is that there's a difference between, in the U.S., difference between long-run demand for reserves and short-run demand. So here in the short run, banks don't want to veer away from reserves because that's what they're used to. It's what their regulators are used to. But maybe in the long run, they could shed some and become more like Canada. The question then ultimately becomes, though, there may not be a complete replication of Canada because of what you mentioned earlier, the smaller set of banks, and there's really much more diverse banking system in the U.S., but maybe we could get part of the way there. Well, uh, about uh, coming back to what you said about QE in Canada, uh, yeah, we did not have QE in Canada. As I said, right now, okay, we talk about zero reserves, but in fact, there's a little bit of it. The Bank of Canada always leaves uh, currently $250 million dollars uh, so one could say that that's the amount of reserves in the system, but it, it's it's tiny compared to uh, transactions every day, which are almost 200 billions per day. So it, it's like zero. And uh, when uh, when things got really bad in 2008, 2009, uh, the largest amount of reserves that we had was 3,000 million dollars or three billion so this was only 10 times more than the small amount uh, which is currently uh, in place so as as you say said we we did not have qe so it was really easy to move to a floor i mean but that was enough to have a floor system yeah, and then it was really easy to come back to the corridor system because going from three thousand to five hundred or two, three thousand to two hundred and fifty million was a very small change, in fact. Yeah, and and it didn't last very long either. So I think in two thousand ten, no. right? You, so it wasn't a very long lived. So yeah, just about a year or something. Yeah. Like that. So this is just to, again to flesh out this point by Bill Nelson. Banks didn't get used to it, right? Banks. It was a short experience. They didn't get used to it. They were used to operating with, with a smaller amount of reserve. So in the case of the U.S., many of the regulations here say you can, for, for regulatory purposes, you could hold like treasury bills or you can hold reserves. But we've held them for so long, for a decade in the U.S., the banks just, they don't know, it's kind of a status quo bias, it's inertia. So, you know, one of the uh, reasons for people calling for a standard repo facility is, is to make it easier for banks to unload those reserves and just hold treasuries. But um, in the meantime, it's hard for them to break old habits. So it's just interesting to see a, you can do things very differently <laughs> with a different setup, different system, different different environment, and again, a different experience. I mean, t- to be fair, again, Canada only had a very brief, brief uh, experience with the floor system. Now, I want to go and, and just talk about the implementation of monetary policy there. So when the Bank of Canada changes its target rate, I mean, we touched on this earlier, the bank doesn't really have to do that much, right? It doesn't have to step in and do a whole lot of open market operations or repos. It kind of just, the corridor itself kind of does the magic for them or the expectations. Or How, how would you explain it? Well, uh, the uh, exactly as you say, uh, the bank does nothing on a quantitative basis. It doesn't okay. change the amount of uh, settlement balances or reserves in the system. It just says we have moved up or down the corridor and the overnight rate adjusts uh, right away. I mean, the, the, it, it's announced in the morning and and that's it. The, the overnight rate uh, will move towards the the new target. It's just it's it's because the bankers know that the central bank, the Bank of Canada, has the ability or the power to move the uh, actual overnight rate towards the target if it wasn't already there. So they know, they know what the target is. They figure that it's going to be uh, implemented, and therefore they 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 go with the announcement. Yeah, don't fight the central bank. It's a losing battle. 
<laughs> no, they, they don't try to, to yep. do that. All right. Well, what are your, your thoughts on the future of the Bank of Canada? I know we want to move on to, to your work on post-Keynesianism, but um, we're about halfway through the show. And I, I just am curious if, if you could wave a magic wand and have the Bank of Canada do anything differently, what would you have it do? Would you have it change its target? Would you have it do like level targeting versus inflation targeting? Would you do anything differently? What, what would you prescribe? Well, it's true that every five years there is a, a, a new discussion. There are discussion papers by the central bank trying to figure out should they move to a new kind of target or should there be two targets uh, like in the United States, uh, you're supposed to have uh, an unemployment target. Well, not a target, but you know, both the inflation rate and the unemployment rate are supposed to be taken into consideration. So, in, in, yeah, in Canada, we had ha we have had the inflation rate target since 1991. Uh, every five years, it was discussed again. Every five years, the, the Bank of Canada has decided, okay, we'll stick with the inflation target. There's always some people who say it should be a price level target, but you know, they're they they pretend that it would be more efficient, but you know, these Claims are based on, uh, ab you know, abstract models that have nothing to do with reality, uh, models where there's no bank, uh, there's hardly any money. So um, I think the discussion right now could be whether the, the Bank of Canada should have more than just an inflation target uh, and have a dual mandate, so to speak, with both taking uh, into account unemployment so I think that's the discussion that will happen over the next few months. Yeah, so a dual mandate for the Bank of Canada like the U.S. has. So I know I know in New Zealand they had a pure inflation target and they've moved also to a dual mandate, so maybe also in Canada in the future. Yeah, exactly. And actually, if you look at the – I mean, it seems to me, looking at the behavior of the Bank of Canada since the uh, subprime crisis – it seems that this is what they have been pursuing because the the target rate of interest, 1.75, is very low when you consider that the rate of unemployment in Canada is at its ever lowest. So it seems to me that in practical terms, uh, the Bank of Canada has been pursuing a dual uh, mandate uh, despite not announcing it officially. So why not go for it officially? Yeah, sure thing. Well, if people at the Bank of Canada are listening, you've heard Mark's suggestion. So maybe they'll follow up in this next review. All right, let's let's switch to post-Keynesian economics. So again, you have this book that people have repeatedly told me to get a hold of, and it's called Monetary Economics, Subtitle, An Integrated Approach to Credit, Money, Income, Production, and Wealth. And your co-author is... Uh, Win is it win? Win good. Yes, win. Win godly. Win. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So this is is a is a book, and um, you know, I I looked at it, um, and I, I I've had some a previous guest on that we talked about, um, the sectoral financial balance sheet approach. But your book is both not just balance sheets, but it's also including you call it transaction flows or incomes as well as the balance sheet, but very detailed post-Keynesian approach to macro. And maybe before we get into all of that, maybe you can just kind of step back and say, what is post-Keynesian economics and how is it different than mainstream macroeconomics? Well, I, 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 I think the difference is uh, about realism. You know, those DSG models, uh, which are at the core of mainstream economics, uh, are full of crazy assumptions. In a sense, the, the post-Keynesian economics looks a bit like uh, what used to be mainstream macro in the 60s. I mean, we, we don't use these assumptions about a representative agent which would be maximizing utility or firms maximizing profits. So we, we don't believe in, uh, in those assumptions. 
And, and then to this, we add uh, things such as uh, markup pricing by firms, you know, firms setting prices on the basis of their unit costs. Uh, we always had this idea of money being endogenous uh, with the central bank having as a target an interest rate and not a stock of money. So uh, post Keynesians have been uh, talking about this uh, since the late 1960s, and we always kept those ideas. Uh, whereas, as you know, mainstream economists now are also adopting the idea that the central bank has an interest rate target. Um, but for a long time, they were close to the monetarist and so on. Yeah, so it, go ahead. I, I, should, I should add that there's a link between modern monetary theory and post-Indian economics. One could say that modern monetary theory uh, on some features is an extreme version of post-Keynesian economics, but uh, the, the people who are uh, advocating, I mean, the scholars who are advocating modern monetary theory uh, were originally post-Keynesian economists. Yeah, and, and you mentioned, just to flesh out the history of this, you mentioned in your article, well, actually in the first chapter of your book, you mentioned some of the original post-Keynesians were those people who maybe knew Keynes, they had worked with him at some point. But Joanne Robinson, Richard Kahn, Nicholas Caldor, James Mead. Um, yeah. And interestingly, James Mead is someone who advocated nominal GDP targeting or something like nominal GDP targeting. Now, of course, he comes from a perspective of using fiscal policy more to get that nominal GDP target. But he's very much about stabilizing demand um, and, and being explicit about it. Here's a question I have for you. Would you consider James Tobin, because you talked about him in your chapter, is is he kind of a quasi post? Would you consider him a quasi post Keynesian? Well, there's certainly he's a Keynesian. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he was very much opposed to uh, Robert Lucas, the new classicals, you know, the real business cycle, macroeconomic theories. Uh, and uh, with respect to uh, portfolio theory, uh, we're using um, many of his uh, equations or ideas. And so there is, there is certainly a, a, a good link between uh, what James Tobin was doing and what uh, Wynne Godley and myself did in the book. The difference is that on some issues, uh, James Tobin was still very much neoclassical. I mean, this is what we would consider. Uh, we, we would say, well, he still had an idea about some exogenous stock of money out there. Um, things of that sort, you know. Okay. Um, in, the, in, the book we have, in the book, we have a whole chapter at the end where we explain the differences uh, between our approach that we have in the book, uh, which uh, which combines the real side and the monetary or financial side, and James Tobin's uh, work in the 70s and 80s, uh, where he was trying to do the same thing, but in our view, uh, with some uh, overly mainstream assumptions, not, not always realistic. Okay. Let me ask this question about post-Keynesianism. So one of the things I've learned from the MMT school in terms of their beliefs is they have a very different view of what is inflation, what, what's, what's the inflation, what causes inflation. And in particular, they see it as a, a power struggle between labor and capital. And as a consequence, it's easier for them to motivate like wage controls, price controls, even credit controls as a way to control inflation. Whereas I think of money still ultimately determined by demand for money. Um, now, I'm, you know, given it's endogenous, but the demand for money, supply of money, kind of a more traditional story for the what, what's inflation now. What drives the demand for money can be a whole host of other things, as you know. But I guess where do post Keynesians come down? Are they more like the MMT, or are they more like what I can I think is standard monetary theory? Well, I, I think we're we're very close to MMT on the issue okay. of inflation. So indeed, there's a lot of talk about conflictual inflation. Uh, perhaps what MMT does not emphasize enough 
is the impact of the exchange rate on uh, on inflation in the sense that if you have a depreciating uh, currency all your foreign products will be costing more and so this may uh, generate inflation in your economy so that might be the difference say between what you hear from MMT uh, scholars and what post Keynesians in general would be emphasizing well that's interesting so I guess but, my- uh, yeah, but if I, if I may say sure I mean, what happens is that MMT authors are mostly American authors. So in a country like the U.S., of course, what happens to the U.S. dollar will not have a big influence on the price level or the rate of inflation. Whereas in many other countries, including all these semi-industrialized countries or uh, development countries, when there is a change in the rate of, of uh, in the exchange rate, there's a big impact uh, on on price inflation. Okay, so let me ask this question then, kind of a same question, different angle. So let's define money real broadly. So everything from currency to treasury bills. All right. So you know institutional money assets, repos, things like that, and everything in between. So a lot of you know, most of that would be money created by you know, private firms. Um, I think consistent with what you, you your view of what money is. So take that definite, very broad, broad measure of money. In fact, um, there's a, a group in the New York that ha- they they create what I call an M4 measure, which has like commercial paper, um, treasury bills, all kinds of sub- somewhat liquid assets. But anyway, take a broad measure of money. With a broad measure of money. Can you plug it into an equation of exchange and, and still find it useful? I mean, th- does the equation of exchange have any meaning? It's just an accounting identity, but does it have any meaning in a post-Keynesian worldview? Well, my own view is that, no, it has no meaning. Okay. <laughs> so it's something you guys don't think about and worry about? Well, I mean, f- for sure, if you have a, a large increase in uh, credits being granted— Mm-hmm. Uh, this will generate an expansion of economic activity. And so eventually it, it may generate a higher rate of inflation. But I think it's, uh, you just you, you just cannot look at uh, a number and believe that because that number has gone up by 5%, some monetary uh, aggregate has gone up by 5%, that this will lead to an increase in uh, nominal GDP of five percent. No, I I agree with that. Actually, I I would say you look at M and V, like money and velocity, that they're both both changing, and you know we don't know what drives velocity. It may be hard to explain. It's kind of an unobservable thing that's going on. But I guess what I'm really getting at then is is maybe the policy implications of all of this. So you would say to a country that's experiencing inflation, an industrialized, advanced economy. You would you would direct them towards price controls as a way to manage inflation. Is that fair? I think it, yeah. I think yes. I, I would agree with that. Okay. Because because the the only other way is to create unemployment, and that has been done. <laughs> yep. uh, in the early 1980s and again in the early 1990s. I mean, with great success, uh, one could say. I mean, we. <laughs> <laughs> the central bank, you know, uh, doubled interest rates, and it was highly successful in reducing inflation. But at the same time, it was highly successful because it managed to uh, almost double unemployment numbers. Yeah, the early '80s recession was a very sharp and painful recession. There's no doubt about that. And we in Canada, we had our first homegrown recession in 1990, 1992, because. There was a real estate bubble in Toronto, and the Bank of Canada decided, okay, we have to crank up those interest rates from 7% to 14%, and they were highly uh, successful. Well, Mark, I mean, in, do- in those days, we could yeah. be very, we were very much critical of what the Bank of Canada was doing. Uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, it's been much harder to criticize the Bank of Canada. Mark, help me understand the case for price and wage controls. So 
One of the big reservations I have with YouthNet approaches is, is that something like that, at least my reading of history says they they don't work well. People find ways around them, a way to cheat, way to at least it can lead to corruption. This ways people try to find ways around these controls. And outside of war times, the, my my reading of the history is and maybe you have a different one is that they're very hard to implement effectively. So so what would you say to that? Well, uh, everything you say is true, but what's the alternative? I mean, the alternative is to raise interest rates and punish everybody. Well, the, there's perhaps a third way, uh, which would be to have credit controls. So you don't raise interest rates, but you you set up rules such that it becomes much harder for firms or households to uh, borrow, get a mortgage or, or whatever. And in fact, this is what the Bank of Canada and the Canadian government have, have been doing over the last two or three years. There, there was these real estate bubbles in Toronto and Vancouver. And uh, I, I think that uh, they have been successful by implementing new rules. You know, you need 20% of a down payment in order to be able to get a mortgage, whereas before it was 5% or even 0%. So I think there are some alternatives to just uh, cranking up interest rates. Okay, so it sounds like, you know, maybe the word credit control or price control to a mainstream person like myself, it, it's, it's a loaded term, right? It's, it's scary. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is. But what you've just described sounds to me like just maybe better regulation of banks or, you know, you have to have so much, you know, down payment when you get a mortgage. That's just a rule. I mean, you know, speaking you, from... You either regulate the banks or you regulate the borrower. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... I, uh, in, the, in the case of mortgages, you would regulate the borrower. You would... The, the, the borrower would be facing rules such that he or she would have a lot of difficulty in, in getting a loan. Yeah, no, I was going to say, personal experience, when I lived in Texas, you know, Texas was slow to be a part of the Great Recession, and one of the reasons why is that they had much tighter rules on mortgages because they had been through the, the housing bust or the recession in the early 80s, I think, and, and as well as the uh, savings and loan crisis when when oil markets crashed, so they had at the state level they had really tightened the screws. You couldn't get like hundred percent financing, for example, in Texas, I, if I if I remember correctly. In any yeah. event, that meant that Texas didn't have all the problems that some of these other states did. Um, but when I look at it that way, it, it just seems like a practical, prudent financial regulation. If you're going to borrow a a lot of money, take funds out for a mortgage, you need to have a lot of capital, a lot of equity, have skin in the game for it. You call that credit control. I guess I'd call that common sense. I don't know. So the way you the way the way you've you've presented it seems much easier, less scary than the word credit control. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well let me ask this question then um with post Keynesian economics. From that perspective, like how would you think about some different historical experiences. I'm going to, I'll throw one out there. For example, um, President Clinton, under him, there was a budget surplus. So we actually began to pay down the national debt. So how would the post-Keynesian view that experience? You, I mean, you can go back to the old Keynesian uh, thinking, uh, which is that you have injections of funds and leaks in funds. So the surplus of the government is a leak in the sense that it's a restriction on the spending that occurs in the economy. And so uh, it may have a negative impact uh, on the economy. I mean, on the one hand, you know, the economy was doing well during the Clinton years. So uh, the government was uh, getting more income taxes than, if you want, than predicted, so to speak. But because it had a government surplus, then it was uh, slowing down the economy at the same time. So that that's one way to to look at it. Yeah, where I find that this balance sheet approach useful is that 
you know, one one transaction somewhere has to be offset in someone else's balance sheet elsewhere in the economy, right? So if the government, yeah, we, yeah go go ahead. No, I, I was going to say it, what you were going to say is true. The sectoral financial balance sheet approach, uh, which was very much uh, put forward by my co-author Win Godley in his uh, empirical work, in his practical work, I find it good uh, to uh, make sure that the various forecasts which are being made by different agencies looking at different parts of the economy, you know, some of them are looking at the government, some of them are looking at the private economy, others are looking at the current account balance or the, you know, the exports and imports. And this uh, balance sheet approach helps us to understand whether there are some inconsistencies in the predictions which are being made. I mean, that's what I find uh, as being the most useful. Because what, what, will, uh, what drives the economy is either the, in, you know, the external driver is either investment, whether it's corporate investment or real estate investment, or it's uh, you know government expenditures. Or when when you look at these balances, you're looking at the residual. You know the difference, say between yep. private saving and private investment. But maybe the uh, maybe the maybe investment is uh, is smaller than saving private saving. But if investment is very large, then it's going to have a big impact on GDP. So those balances are helpful, but you must also take into account that GDP is made up of uh, four components, which is uh, consumption, investment, whether it's corporate or real estate investment, and government expenditures, the, you know, plus the net exports. So those are the four components of GDP. So you're saying that you got to do more than just the balance sheet approach. You got to do the transaction flow approach as well. Look at yes, look, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what I, I guess noticed looking at your book it is broader than just the sectoral financial balance sheet approach. But it's still they're still useful. Let, let me ask this question then again from the, the post Keynesian perspective. So right now, President Trump is running huge budget deficits, and you could argue that's adding stimulus to the economy or it added stimulus to the economy, and maybe it's, it's, the effect is you know, wearing out now. How would you, as a post-Keynesian, evaluate that statement? Well, you know, President Trump is, uh, is a bit like President Reagan in the sense that both of them are the biggest Keynesian presidents. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Because they are running those huge uh, deficits, yeah. and when those deficits are being caused by autonomous decisions, uh, then they have a very favorable impact on the economy. So any Keynesian uh, who was teaching in the 1960s <laughs> would say exactly that. You know, post-Keynesians would say it. Uh, right now, but uh, Keynesians 50 years ago would also say the same thing. It's only over the last 30 or 35 years that people would be saying, oh, if there is a deficit, people will be scared about their future taxes, therefore they will reduce consumption. So those are part of the unrealistic assumptions that are being made by some of our mainstream colleagues. All right, last question, because our time is coming near an end here. But would you view like your textbook, the the balance sheet approach, the income or the transaction flow matrix, all all of those models in your book, would you view them as a complement to mainstream macro, something that like a mainstream macroeconomist could use in conjunction with their existing models? Or is this is it an outright substitute? Like you would you'd say stay away from mainstream macro and just use my stuff, or could they be used together? Well, I think, I think the book had two contributions, so to speak. Uh, on the one hand, we presented a methodology, which is the so-called stock flow consistent approach, uh, uh, which just makes sure that the accounting is right and that there are no black holes. Uh, 
So this is good both for mainstream economics and non-mainstream economics. On the other hand, uh, all the models that we had as examples of this stock flow consistent approach uh, were based on, one could say, post-Keynesian assumptions, which in some cases, many cases, are quite different from the assumptions which are entertained by mainstream economists. So you have those two sides uh, of the book. If I'm talking about the uh, behavioral equations which are in the book, yes, they are an alternative to mainstream thinking. All right. Well, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Mark Lavoie. Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, it was a very interesting discussion, and many thanks for having me. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.